Um, If you have your Bible, let's open it up to Mark chapter 2. Or if you don't have a Bible, there should be these Bible journals somewhere nearby. Uh, Back in October, we went through Mark chapter 1. We have some of these, I think, laying around, uh, either in the bottoms of the seats or or something. Uh, But but you can find one of those. These are great. Uh, You can highlight and write within them, and then there's a whole page for notes next to the Scripture, so you can take notes and stuff like that. And so uh, take those as our gift to you. We'll buy more if we need to buy more, uh, but we'd love for you to just take those and... um, and use them as we study through this book, which is what we're doing. We're, we're going through the book of Mark. Uh, for the majority of this year, we'll be in the book of Mark. So for the next couple months, we're going to be uh, in Mark chapters 2, 3, and 4. And then we'll take a break for uh, leading into Easter. And then right after Easter, back in April, we're going to just get right back into it in chapters 5, 6, and 7. And uh, we'll take that to the summer. And then the goal, essentially, is to get through the whole book of Mark by Easter of 2020. Five, all right, so we'll be in it for a while, and uh, but it's a it's just such a fa- fascinating story um, about Jesus, and um, and I'm and I'm just excited to teach it. And so um, we're in Mark two today, uh, starting in verse one. And uh, if uh, if for some reason you missed or weren't a part of our church during um, October when we did Mark chapter one, you can always go back and re-listen to those or watch those or whatever. So. Um, Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And when he returned, he is Jesus. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof from above him. And when they had made the opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose immediately, picked up his bed, and went out before them all. And they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Never saw anything like this. I love this scene with Jesus at the beginning of this story. Um, he, he tells us in chapter one, his mission, his goal is to preach and teach the gospel of the kingdom of God. And that's exactly what you see him doing here in chapter two as it starts. You see him beginning to preach and teach uh, and he's preaching and teaching, and there are people all around. But uh, he's, uh, at, at many of the times which he's been teaching and preaching previously, there's also been a, an accompaniment of miracles that take place. And that doesn't seem to be the intent on which Jesus is engaging in this practice of teaching here. This doesn't seem to be what he's intending to do, is to, to heal people um, in, in this setting. But there is a group uh, of at least four men and a paralytic who want to know Jesus' healing power and healing potential. And, um, and, and I don't have a whole lot of time to go into this, but, but I, I, I just, there was something about that as I was reading through that that I like really circled and underlined it. Uh, because it, to me, um, we all need four men or four women in our life like this who care about us deeply enough and, and love us deeply enough to go to any lengths possible uh, for, for our good and for our benefit and to get us ultimately closer to Jesus. We need everybody, I think, no matter how introverted or extroverted you are, we need people like this in our life to help us get closer to God. And, uh, and so I just, 
I, I just love that idea that these guys, they've heard of Jesus' power, his ability. They've probably heard stories of his healing, uh, and they are intent on getting their friend in front of Jesus. And so much so that they can't get through the crowd, and so they climb up on a roof, and they dig a hole in the roof. Now, this is apparently either uh, Jesus' actual house um, or a house of a close friend, uh, but Jesus' home where he lives now is in Capernaum. So this is either uh, a, a friend of his house or it's his house. Uh, it says that he went home. So uh, it, I, don't, I don't think it really matters, um, the, the specific details, but the, the details are there's somebody who's digging through the roof of somebody's house. <laughs> and, and I don't know about you, but that's a, that's a brilliant plan, to be honest. Like, it's brilliant to, like, begin to dig that hole through that roof. It's, it's a brilliant idea because if you lower a human being on top of someone, they have to move. Uh, they don't have to move if you're just trying to get through the crowd. They don't have to get out of your way. They have to get out of the way of someone who's coming down on top of them, right? Like that's just, so it's just a brilliant plan. I, I, love, I love the idea. It, it, it's unfortunate that it destroys someone's home, but I love the idea, right? Um, and, and so they lower this paralytic down, and there, there's clearly, there, there's a clear picture of what this paralytic and these four men who have brought him to Jesus are after. They're after this healing of Jesus. They're after experiencing the stories that they've been told about and hearing the stories that they've read about. Um, and in uh, Jesus' first words, given that context, seem pretty strange, right? I mean, he's there to be healed. And Jesus' first words are strange, unless you actually know Jesus and what Jesus is about. <laughs> Right, Because Jesus is always about healing people from something that's far more chronic than disease or paralysis. Look at what he says in verse 5. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. This is so key in the ministry of Jesus and what Jesus is all about and why Jesus comes to earth. It is because there is a clear problem called sin that Jesus is bent and intent on dealing with above anything and everything else. He is bent on dealing with this problem of sin. And many believed, honestly, in this culture, many people believed, and probably most of the people surrounding Jesus at that time, as he's teaching this, believed that this man was actually paralyzed because of his sin. If you were blind, or you were deaf, or you were mute, or you were paralyzed, many people believed it was because of something that you had done, that this was your, your punishment for your sin, that you must have to live in this space. And so for Jesus to utter these words, your sins are forgiven, in that context was immensely, immensely important for those who were on looking and who were listening. But also, there's this aspect um, that, I, that I think is important that we understand about Jesus um, a, 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 that, he is, that he's fully bent on this idea of dealing with sin because he actually, in the Sermon on the Mount, he, he tells people to blind themselves and essentially paralyze themselves in order to do away with sin. He, he tells people, he says, if, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to lose one part of the body than to lose the entire body to hell because of your sin. <laughs> Jesus is so intently bent on dealing with sin that he tells people to take extreme measures at times to deal with the, the sin that's in their life. And he is going to take extreme measures to deal with the sin that's in people's lives. But um, the, the truth is, um, there is a faith that makes the forgiveness of sins possible, or at least taking hold of the forgiveness of sins possible. See, the Bible talks about faith, this, this kind of faith many times. It says that we are saved by grace, means that, that we are given a free gift. We're saved because Jesus chose to save us. He chose to give us a gift. We actually have to believe that he's given it to us and we actually have to take it. That's faith. That's belief. And so we actually have to accept it. It says we're saved by grace through faith. James says that faith without works is dead. Seemingly saying that it seems like saving faith, it leads us to act in a way that we actually trust and believe that Jesus has the authority over all creation, over sin, over disease, and so forth. 
We have a we we know that we are saved when we have a faith that goes into action. That is acting based off of what we believe. So it is it is through this this faith in which we accept the grace which sets us free from the curse of sin. That's the gospel. Uh, that we are set free from this curse of sin because of the grace of Jesus. If we have faith enough to believe he's given it to us and accept it, then we don't have to live in eternal separation from God, but we can live and be with God today and tomorrow and for eternity. And that we can live out of this true identity in which God has created us to be his masterpiece and to be his holy people, a royal priesthood set apart to do his good works that his kingdom may come here on earth as it is in heaven through us. That's essentially what Jesus is up to. That's what he's bent on dealing with. But let me, let me, uh, say this because I think this is a really important uh, thing that we understand and realize it's that if we um, if we get enamored too much with theological debate we're likely going to miss what God and Jesus are trying to do if we get too enamored with theological debate we're likely going to miss what God and Jesus are trying to do this is where the Pharisees and scribes find themselves in the story look at verse 6 and 7 again it says Um, Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? What is their issue with Jesus? Think about it for a second. What's the issue that they have with Jesus? Why are they so outraged at Jesus making this statement? Why are you so bothered by it? Here's my theory. It's because he's working outside of the box that they have built to put God in and made God live in. And they do not have the faith to think that God is bigger than their box. And they do not believe that God could be using Jesus and working through Jesus in order to do this great work. Which says something to me. It would appear that there is a type of knowledge about the Bible and about God and about theology and all these other kinds of things that can actually keep us from saving faith. It can keep us from something better because we want to build a box and put God in that box and say, this is how God works. The problem with the scribes and the Pharisees, the the problem is they use God's word to build their box. They're very smart. They know the word better than anyone else listening. But what they've done is they've taken the word and then they, oh, because of the word, we build this box and this is how God works now. And, and we sometimes might do that as well. But the problem with that is that the Bible, when you read the Bible, the Bible is not about giving us the ability to build a box to put God in. The Bible is about telling us a story about a God that we can't put in a box. That's what it's about. And so we can use the scriptures to build a box and put God inside that box. Or we can just read the scriptures and go, man, God is bigger than I understand and than I can realize. And he can do more than I can even imagine. And so if we get enamored with theological debate, we're going to miss it. Their problem, their problem with Jesus was that uh, they believed God alone can only forgive sins. They prayed this every single day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. That, that idea, the Lord is one, that phrase is the same phrase here, God alone, uh, that's used in this passage. And so he's saying, like, we can't think of God using someone other, like, we can't, we can't think of him coming and being and, and this actually being something in a way in which God works. If this is how God works, it doesn't fit within our box. That was their problem. 
And Jesus, knowing this, he's destroying their box. I mean, he's just obliterating that. But question is, is have we done this? Have you and I done this? Have we began to have we have we begun to, to construct a box and put God inside of a box? Determined um, on, on how he works and, and what's most important to him. Because the reality is, is it's not just the scribes and Pharisees who put Jesus in a box. Everybody puts Jesus in a box. His disciples put him in a box. They just had a little bit more faith in their box than the scribes and the Pharisees. But they still had a box. As we go throughout this, this book, you're going to see, like, the disciples had Jesus in a box, and, and it wasn't until post-resurrection, when he shows up after he's uh, been crucified and buried and raises from the dead. When he raises from the dead, he b- obliterates their box. Because they, they had no understanding of that whatsoever. They had no construct for that, for believing that. And having faith in that. And so we all typically will create a box. But it, but it is the resurrection of Jesus that obliterates the box. Because now the disciples, once they realize, oh man, like he's doing more than I ever thought. And he's doing exactly what he said. I just didn't realize what he was saying the whole time. You know, like all of those things, they begin to transform and change the way that people look at God. They change the way that um, people engage and interact with God. They change um, the way that, um, that people see the Messiah and, and the kingdom as a whole. But if I'm being honest, what I'm afraid, what I'm afraid of is, is not that we've created a box for God to live in. My fear is we actually prefer that God over the real God. We prefer the God who lives within our box that we've built for him as opposed to the God that he is in the scriptures. That's my fear. That we prefer that God over a God who can define himself independently from our preconceived ideas and misinterpreted readings of his word. God in a box is a lot safer. He's a lot easier to explain. He's a lot easier to follow and a whole lot easier to trust. (laughs) Because he's not going to do anything outside of this box. But what happens when he starts doing something outside the box? We either have to like go, no, 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 that's not God. Or we have to change. So it's easier to keep him there. But what I want you to see in this story is that this story shows us anything. If it shows us anything, it shows us that Jesus' authority puts him outside of whatever construct we want to bind him by. Whatever we want to put around him, he can just absolutely, he has the authority to do away with that. Because his authority is boundless, his authority is limitless, and he knows what these scribes are thinking, and he decides, you know what, let me just challenge your boundaries of the the, the area in which you've placed God in. Let me show you that God's bigger than you realize. And he's doing more than you can understand. Look at verse 8. It says, And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, he said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? He said to them, Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your mat, and walk? Verse 10 is the key verse. It says, But. Now, uh, there's a guy that I follow, Pastor Derwin Gray down in Charlotte. I follow him a little bit. Uh, pretty uh, cool dude. Um, and he's not cool because of this, but this is a key phrase that he does uh, teach his uh, congregation to pay attention to. And, um, and, and he, he always says, we, at our church, we like big butts and we cannot lie. Uh, and... Um, Y'all need to laugh at that. That's a joke. That's funny. And, and it's really funny. Um, so 
I, every time I hear him say it uh, in one of his sermons, I laugh out. I just cannot help but laugh. Uh, because, because the reality is there are moments where it's like you think it's this way, but. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. He says to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose immediately, picked up his bed, and went home before them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. This is, a, this is a big but because it is, it is Jesus saying, but so that you don't mistake and you don't make the mistake, but so that you are, are, are will stop putting God in a box, but so that you may know that I am the one God in which you pray to every day. It's a really, really big but. And it's good for us to understand it because, man, Jesus is not, he's not healing this guy's physical condition just so that this guy can be healed from some sort of physical condition. He's healing this guy's physical condition to show that he has the authority and possesses the authority and the power to deal with this guy's spiritual condition. That he has the authority to forgive sins. That he has the authority to declare him forgiven. Which means he has the authority to say the same thing about us. It's really, really a big deal. It would seem that him healing is a means to show that there's nothing he can't do. And there's nothing that he doesn't have authority over. So put him in a box. That's fine. You can say, God, you have authority over my life inside this box. All you want. And what he's saying is, no, 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 no. I have authority over it all. You want to follow me, you better give it to me. You better give it all to me. You better give all of it to me. I want you to think about this for a second. I, I'm sure many of you have heard this story before. Uh, if you grew up in church, you probably heard this story taught in Sunday school, the man lowered through the roof or, um, or whatever. I know I remember hearing it as a little boy. And, um, and I've always read it, and I've just been like, oh, great. I love this story. It's so cool. It's so cool how they lower him through the roof and all the stuff, and he's healed, and that's great. And it's not until recently as I was studying this and reading this that like, I began to really like, see the, the, the depth of healing that actually took place when Jesus tells him to pick up his mat and walk. I mean, think about this. A paralytic laying on that bed for years and years and years, and Jesus just says, rise, pick up your mat, and walk. I mean, have we even put together in our heads or in our hearts the fact that likely he would not have had the muscular skeletal structure to do any of those things? They're like, him laying there was a was 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 like he had no ability to stand on his own no ability to bend over no ability to lift something and carry it any sort of like length of time whatsoever like his whole body was compromised and so what we see in this story is we see not just a man who now is able to walk if he goes through physical therapy for six months. We see a man who's completely restored in that moment, completely transformed, completely healed, completely transformed. He's not the same person anymore. The result of this transformation is people begin to take notice. They begin to worship God. They begin to praise him. They begin to say, man, we've never seen anything like this before. But here's something that I think is really key about this paralytic story is that he actually wanted to change. He actually wanted a new life. He wanted something new. He wanted God 
to transform him and change his life. What about us? Do we, do we really want to change? If we're going to follow Jesus, we have to ask ourselves if we really want to change. Do we want to do we want to tear down the walls that we've built up? Break down the boxes that we've used to confine God? Do we really want to change? Here's the reality is that if we don't, we will end up like the scribes and the Pharisees who just won't let their box be messed with. And we will not have faith like this man who finds full transformation and healing. If we do not want to change, when God begins to do something as we're following him that challenges us to change, we're going to say, nope, and we're just going to go back to our old life. When what he wants of us is going to make us uncomfortable or be difficult or it's going to uh, raise in us a sense of, um, of frustration, if what he leads us in, like if we don't want to change, we will reject all of what God is trying to do outside of our box. And we will miss the opportunity for real transformation. And a more important transformation, by the way, it's more important than physical healing. It's a spiritual transformation that begins to take place. What if you and I, what if you, you and I believed in the promises of God enough to put our faith in action? What if you and I believed and had enough faith that if we did everything that we could do within our power, if we pushed aside all of the barriers that keep us from him and found ourselves face to face with Jesus, what if we actually believed that if we did that, became face to face with the true God and, and, and knew our need for transformation, that he might actually transform us? What if? What if we began to live this way? Can he transform us if we live this way? Will he transform us if we live this way? Not physically, but, but spiritually. And then wouldn't that be just such a substantial transformation? And what do you think the result would be? You think people would take notice? You think people would turn and worship God? seeing how he's transformed you. Here's what, here's what I'm proposing for 2024. For, for you guys and for me and for all of us. What if for the next 12 months we just took God out of the box? What if for the next 12 months we started to push through the barriers and the things that keep us from him, the distractions and the... the constructs that we've built in our minds? What if we dug through the walls and did everything we could do to get to Jesus because we believed that he can really transform us if we get there? That he can really change us? that he can make something new out of you and out of me. What if we actually did that? I believe that there'd be people who take notice. I believe that people would see that transformation and begin to worship God. It may not be like a worldwide phenomenon and there might not be stories told about us on the internet or whatever, I don't know, right? But I bet our kids would know. I bet our spouses would know. I bet our coworkers would know. I bet our fellow students would know. 
I bet those within our community of faith would begin to take notice. Man, God's doing something in you. I'm confident that, man, there's nothing more powerful that we can do for God and for the kingdom than let him change and transform us from the inside out for our good and his glory. I'm confident there's nothing more important we can do. Because if we let him do that, like, he can do anything through us. He could do anything if he could change our hearts. So let us go for it, you know? Why not? Let us go for it this year. I mean, what do we have to lose? A bunch of false like ideas that we've built up around ourselves. Maybe we have to, maybe, maybe, maybe we lose like some comfort. Maybe we lose some security. Maybe we lose something that we, we think we have to have in order to survive. Like, guys, it's all, it, it's all a facade. Let them tear down the walls. He's got something better for us. The only thing we're going to lose is the false self. And what he's going to put in its place is our true, authentic selves. The ones he's created us to be. Stop being so stubborn. Jesus says, Jesus says in the Gospels, he says, if, if you want to follow me, the, you have to deny yourself. Pick up your cross. He's telling you you have to be crucified. The self that you've built yourself up to be, the false self, it has to die in order that you can have something better and something new, a more abundant life, which he's come to give us. And I know, man, there are some really good things in this world that have been dangled in front of us and we've taken hold of and we love them. But they aren't getting a cross for you. And so you might want to let them go. You might want to let them go and take Jesus at his word. Don't let any commitments push aside your desire to be with Jesus. Don't let anything that you have built up in your mind or any arguments other people would lay on you, don't let uh, your pace of life or your, your lack of financial security, don't let anything keep you from your desire to be with Jesus. Don't let the fact that God moves more slowly than we would like him to keep you from going, <laughs> right? I mean, like, the reality is this guy's transformation, we read it and we're like, oh, that's going to happen to me? Like, I'm going to show up tomorrow at the feet of Jesus, he's just going to change me? Probably not. <laughs> He'll probably change you if you come again and again and again and again. And the Bible says that he doesn't see slowness the way that we see slowness. It's talking about the return of Christ, that he's coming again. But the reason why he is slow is because he's patient and it's because he's kind and it's because he's loving. And he wants everyone, everyone to have a chance to change. Everyone to have a chance at new life. And so let him work slowly and let him give us a new life. But I say we go for it because we don't have a whole lot to lose. We don't have a whole lot to lose. But we just have to remember he's, he's not bound by our boxes. He's not bound by space or time. He does what he wills in a space and time in which we give him and he wills to work. And so, come what may, I truly believe that if we'll give ourselves to this, we turn the page from 2024 to 2025, you're not gonna be the same person you were today. You're gonna be something different. 
you're going to be something new, something better, something more like Jesus. But we have to give ourselves to it. We have to want to change. We have to want to change.